<laughs> Hallelujah. Well, praise God. The Lord is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Joshua chapter 5. I'm not going to hold you long. Praise God. I want to just finish up. Amen. This series we've been doing, Pulling Down Strongholds. Now, I don't do a whole lot of teaching, amen, because usually, amen, we're teaching, you know, we, we talk about implementation, you know, uh, give you, amen, f um, um, steps on how to implement God's word. But I just want to kind of just encourage you along those lines of what we've already shared with you. Now, remember last um, Wednesday, we, uh, last Sunday, rather, we were talking about ruling in the midst of our enemies, if you remember that. And we kind of shown you the lack, um, that a lack rather, of the presence of God's word in your mouth and mind and heart will, will keep um, the dying process, not a lack of, but keeping that word in your mouth, all right? Having that word in your mouth and in your heart it will keep the dying process that the Lord intended you to go through. It will keep it operating or in motion is a better way of saying it in our lives. To what? To the pulling down of strongholds. Amen. So, and of course, when we establish the fact that this is created by what? Wrong thinking, wrong believing, wrong teaching, wrong association. Amen? And wrong examples. <laughs> Amen. You know, as, as, as young kids, we're very vulnerable. You know, we learned primarily by example. And all of us have to admit, we had some bad examples. Amen. We all did. So that included, you know, everybody in our lifetime prior to us getting saved. Amen? And, of course, including our parents. Like I said on Sunday, you know, they weren't perfect. They did the best that they could do. So, they meant well, but they weren't flawless. Now, God knew all of this. God knew all of this. And like I was telling someone the other day, I mean, it's something that the church has yet to understand. And it's very unfortunate because it has stopped a lot of church people from being vigilant. Amen? Peter admonished all of us to be sober and to be vigilant. Why? Because our adversary is walking around seeking whom he may devour. Why is he seeking? Because he can't devour everybody. Amen? God has placed up on this planet, unfortunately, and I want to put it this word this way because to make an impact on your thinking, this is Satan's playground. Earth is. And when our parents, Adam and Eve, disobeyed, God then just wasn't winging it as he went along. <laughs> like we do <laughs> you know we react and respond you got to understand our father is so great he considered every individual that would come through this earth realm amen their place their purpose amen and he knew what would happen and what would not happen. He knew the choices you would make. I believe that the Christians have not responded properly to heaven because we have not understood heaven. Amen. The gospel that Paul preached and the other disciples It's not what's preached in most churches. Amen. 
we, we have not been taught how to pray. We have not been taught how to fight. We have not been taught how to be disciples. We have not been taught how to lay down our lives. Amen. So consequently, there's another generation coming up of millennials that have no purpose. They have no cause. And now the world is giving them a false cause that is purposeless. That they don't understand the end game. But you as believers should. Amen. Whether you realize it or not, God put it within each one of us the desire to lay down our life. Something to die for. That's inherently in all of us. Amen. You only see some people step to the plate and do it. like firefighters, policemen, soldiers who don't think twice about laying down their life. But that's inherently in all of us. Amen. And if we turn to the Lord, that call to lay down our life will begin to grow within us. Amen. It would. Paul said, as Paul said, right into the church in Rome, he said, What? I die daily. Didn't he? I die daily. So, one of the attributes of a Christian is to die to their own desires. Amen. On self gratification. And give themselves to what? The cause of Christ. Amen. So what is that? What is that then? That's the life of a disciple. Is that right? The first thing Jesus said. The first thing he said in retrospect to preaching the gospel. When he began to preach the gospel. One of his main teachers was... Deny yourself. Now that doesn't mean that God don't want you happy. But let me ask you this. Define happiness. Amen. The world will tell you that happiness comes from having a white house, a picket fence, a dog, a couple of kids, you know, and a nice retirement. That's what the world will tell you. Really? Really? Well, see, as a Christian, happiness is stemmed from the joy of the Lord, knowing the Lord. So, brother, sister, it doesn't matter if you lose everything you got today. Is it possible to be happy? It most certainly is. Because it's, it comes from knowing a person, not possessing things. Matter of fact, Paul said, life does not consist in the abundance of things you possess. Huh? But, but, but corporation knows the vanity of humans. So they spend millions of dollars of advertisement to convince you that your life is meaningless without this. Huh? And then you'll start imagining that in your garage, imagining that on your coffee table. Okay, well, let's ask a man who was the most wisest man that ever lived. Let's ask him. See? If someone walked that road, then we don't have to think. Right? We just have to listen to what he has to say since he has both experience and knowledge. So let's ask the wisest man that ever lived. Solomon. 
huh? who had God, I don't know mighty how many wives, <laughs> can't begin to count how many wives he had and how many concubines he had. Thousands. But yet he wrote all oh, this vanity. No one had the wealth that he had. Gold upon gold upon gold upon gold upon gold. But yet he wrote all his vanity. No one had the wisdom that the man had. He could look at something and tell you from a bee flying, a man, to a crocodile swimming in a stream, to a bird flying in the sky, until trees planted in a garden, and tell you meticulously the purpose why God made them. But yet he wrote all his vanity. Vanity, vanity, all his vanity. What did he mean? Enjoyment. Life, everything that you need as a human does not come from any of those things. If, if the blueprint of the creator is upon your life, only the creator can satisfy you. Amen. Only the creator can. So what am I saying to you, brother, sister? We have to go back. We have to go back to truth. If we are to find out what heaven intended for us, what heaven wanted for us, we have to go back to truth. And unfortunately, I'm sorry. As a preacher of the gospel, I'm sorry that it has truth has been so watered down. Amen. Truth is being so compromised. I mean, it is self-evident. And the hundreds of religions that we have. And so even in Pilate's day, when he stood before Jesus... When there was not even a Bible, Pilate looked at the Lord and said, what is truth? <laughs> what is truth? Well, Pilate was married to a woman who began to get a glimpse of what truth was. In her dream, she ran down to Pilate and said, have nothing to do with this righteous man. In a dream, Holy Spirit revealed to her that this was truth. And so you notice how, Pilate, how the Lord conversed with Pilate, but he didn't waste his time with Herod. He didn't even say a word to Herod. But he had a conversation with Pilate. And because he did, what happened? Pilate began to see. How do you know that? Because the fear of God began to grip him. And from that point on, he sought to do what? Release Jesus. But guess what? But if truth does not dominate your life, if light does not dominate your life, you will cave to something. Amen. And in this case, Pilate caved to what? Political pressure. Amen. The Jewish people in, 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 in the court stood out yelling. You know, we have no God but Caesar. We pledge no allegiance to no one but Caesar. And so Pilate began to feel the pressure, you know, because, in other words, that's what he should be doing. So what did Pilate do? He thought he could reason with these people. But you cannot reason with demons.
demon powers was so moving amongst the crowd and affecting the mind of the people. Pilate thought he could reason with them. So then he told his guards, take him and, and, and scourge him. Now that was in his mind. I will scourge him and surely that will be enough. So they took Jesus and beat him with a cat of nine tails. A stick with leather strips on it with glass, stones, nails, everything tied to it with nine strips and they beat him 49 times. That was, that, was, that was Roman law. How, how many, how many uh, uh, saw what's his name's movie? What, what was his name? Mel Gibson. He's getting ready to make another one. Well, you saw how bad that was? It was worse than that, the way they beat him. It was worse than that. So Jesus came back, blood all over him. And Pilate said, behold your king. And they yelled away with him. Why did Jesus do that? He didn't have to. Why did he allow his flesh to be scourged to where his bones was exposed? His bones. I submit to you, though Jesus was a man, there was no sin in him. There was no sin in him. And because there was no sin in him, look at what he was able to take. After all of that, he still had to carry the cross from palace court to Golgotha. I walk those streets. It's no little ways. Why did he do it? Why did he do it? He did it because he loved his father. And his father loved you. But what's so amazing to me is how Pilate thought he could reason with them. Listen, God knowing the mind of man. What am I talking about? You need to understand God's ways. We as Christians more than any day now need to understand God's ways. Though God do not force any man God does not manipulate any man. God does not tempt any man. James says God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempt he any man. But every man, every person is tempted when he's drawn away in his own lust. That word, Greek word lust is not sexual. It means pressure. Wherever the enemy prays pressure on the weakness of the flesh, you will be tempted. So what am I saying to you? You are a walking temptation. And I don't mean, you know, the temptation. (laughs) I'm dating myself. Some of you don't even know who the temptation was. But anyway, 
That was a group called the temptation, you know. But you are a walking temptation. Amen. So God the Father knew before time was what pressure the enemy would be applying to your life right now. God knew. But God gave a remedy for you to overcome every test, every trial. God did. Well, let me ask you a question. Why aren't more Christians overcoming? Why aren't more Christians overcoming? When it comes to something being a part of your life for such a long, 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 long time, it is not as easy to say no to it. Come on. It's not as easy to say no to it. Especially if your flesh enjoys it. What happens to anything that you've been dependent on all of your life and has become a crutch to you when you try to take it away? That element of fear. Fear starts coming in. The fear of the unknown. Huh? Because you can't cling to it. You can't run to it anymore. You can't depend upon it anymore. You know, the level of evil of it, you know, is, is you know, it's, it, it, it can be argued, you know, because what's right in our eyes is not right in God's eyes. For instance, you know, some people out there, you know, who don't have the means, the wherewithal to meet their own needs, they find absolutely nothing wrong with stealing. Because they feel if they don't steal, they can't survive. Huh? Right? But the Bible said, Thou shalt not steal. Let him that stole steal no more, and let him work with his own hands that he may have that which to give. God don't want you to be a thief, He wants you to be a giver. But guess what? You tell a person that lived their own life dependent on that and that's the only way they survive and they don't know how to survive anyway and you come along and tell them you cannot steal. You don't tell me fear will grip their heart? Won't grip their heart? Well, how am I going to live? Who can I depend upon? And how am I expect to depend upon someone I can't see? Well, that's just an example on how the enemy attacks us when it comes to our temptations, our weaknesses, the, f the pressure that our flesh puts upon us. But we have not thought, to, thought and set down how to psychologically evaluate some things that happens this fast in our lives. But we never considered why does it happen that way? Why do certain things happen this way in my life automatically when certain situations happen in my life? Why do certain words come out of my mouth at, cer at certain times when certain situations I'm confronted with certain situations all the time? We never stop to consider it. But then truth comes along, the word comes along, and forces you to. The, the pressure God brings upon is not a pressure to make you do. It is a pressure to expose you to what you are doing. So Jesus said, if you come to me, you got to first deny yourself. 
deny yourself. First of all, that is anything that is not like God. So when you're coming to him, there's a whole lot about God you don't know. So you're going to make mistakes. Because you are in a learning process. Right? Deny yourself. Secondly, there are things that are not necessarily sin. You're going to have to deny yourself too. Why? Because it sets you up to sin. You say, come on, is that right? Yes, this is why the Bible said, lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets you. Weights enable you from running because we're in a race, right? A race for our life. We're running through life. There's a certain amount of time given to each one of us on this planet. And there are things we must do and there's something we must become. Right? There are things that we can do to shorten our life. Even, even cause it to become ineffective. You see a lot of people. We think it's just the drunks, drunks on the street that are ineffective. That has no purpose or meaning. There's people who dress every day with suit and tie that are ineffective. That has no purpose. Listen, unless it's heaven... This is what I want you to understand. Unless it is heaven's script, unless it is heaven's design, it is ultimately ineffective. Because every single one of us, whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, we're going to have to stand before this king that gave his life. We're going to have to stand before him and we're going to have to give an account of everything we did and everything we said. Everything. Whether they be good or evil. Revelations 21, the great white throne judgment when all of the dead, small and great, will stand before the Lord and one by one and we all will be there. And you will determine, amen, how you live this life, whether you're on his left or whether you're on his right, watching what's happening. But we all will be there and we all will see. And everybody will see. What do you mean? You're just going to stand there and just tell? No, like a picture screen, it's going to run off on the screen everything that you did that was unrepentant of. As a believer, we are, not, we, we, we are not at the great white throne. We're at the judgment seat of Christ. That's different for the believer. The judgment seat of Christ is not the judgment of our sins. It is a time of judgment to determine what rewards you will get and what rewards you forfeited. You forfeited. The father will say to you, this is the script of your life. And he will hand you the book. This is the, with your name on it. This is the book of your life. And this is what should have happened in your life. But this is the book you've written. This is what you did. And brother, sister, there will be many Christians that will stand there and plead, Lord, I did not know. That is no excuse. Because he told you, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. He gave us the means to receive. There is no excuse of not knowing. Brother says, I can't talk about your life. I don't know you, but I can talk about my life. A 
as I look back over my life, I can see, and it would be no different from you, I can see the hand of God moving in my life when he could, even when my life wasn't surrendered to him. God has no respect to a person. Listen, you are blessed beyond reason when there is someone in your family that came before you that know how to pray for you. You are. Because it is somewhere, someone in a corner somewhere praying, calling out your name to God, amen, that will help God, amen, maneuver you through life. And ultimately help you meet certain appointments in your road throughout this life. What do you mean meet certain appointments? There are fullness of times in your life, just like it was in Jesus' life. Remember the Bible says in the fullness of time, God came. And when God came, you hear Jesus says things that I have to be about my father's business. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit made it made it a point to make sure Jesus was at certain places at certain times. Why? Because it was written concerning him. Do you not think it's any different concerning you? It is no different. There are certain people, paths you should cross. There are certain people you should correspond with. There are certain things that you should do on this earth. It is all written concerning you. It is all it all ultimately brings you to the fulfillment and to fulfillment, first of all, on the inside. Because you'll never really, really, really be happy. You won't. Let me give you an illustration. You know, Ford makes Ford cars. Right? And when Ford gives you a manufacturer's book, it suggests it that you should use Ford parts, right? They strongly suggest. Now, because some of us, we're so cheap, right? We look for aftermarket stuff, right? But guess what? Ford says, if you're under warranty, I won't guarantee the warranty if you go put aftermarket stuff in this car. Ford said, I can only warrant, warranty what I made. So if that car, that, that car could speak and you put, you know, a Chevy part or aftermarket part in that car, if that, and that car could speak, that car would say, hey, this ain't no Ford product. Take that out of me. If that car could speak. See? Well, guess what? Jesus made you. God made you. And God put within you deep within you a preset agenda for your life it's there there's only two roads you can walk on two his or your own that's it and that's why Jesus amen Spoke, and that's why some of the prophets spoke and said, Choose, choose you this day who you're going to serve, what road you're going to walk on. Right? So, if you take your life back to the manufacturer, Almighty God, or you take your life to his enemy. Lucifer. Lucifer got some good aftermarket parts. He does. In the world, there is pleasure. There is pleasure in sin. But guess what? Them aftermarket parts going to cost you. Like the guy that used to run the transmission com commercial. Pay me now or pay me later. Service your car now or pay me later. Huh? And that's what we Christians do.
God's the manufacturer. Here is the manual. God tells you as a Christian what you should do. Spend time with me. Pray. Seek my face. Do this. Do that. You know, but we're small. We're feeling good. You know, we're feeling, you know, physically and spiritually. You know, I went to church. I shouted. I read the scripture. I feel good. But the devil is looking at you on the side of the road and just laughing. <laughs> They're going to put it in my service station real soon. Because they ain't going back to the manufacturer. Huh? And so the devil played a trick on us. We get some of his parts. Now the devil wants to incapacitate you forever. He wants you to end up on the spiritual junk heap of life where you'll never return. Ever. But this is so great about God. God went to the junkyard of life and found us. We was on the backside of the dump, all rusted out, and all of our parts were gone. And we got all the enemies manufactured parts on the inside of us. Well, the enemy used us up and then threw us in the junk heap. God comes along and replaces all the parts with his. Amen. And makes us a new creature. A new creature. But he admonishes us. Come after me. Eh? Keep your warranty paid up. Come after me. And I'll make sure that you finish with joy. But some kind of way, the enemy always finds a way to convince us that God is the problem, not him. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I tell you tonight, and of course you know this, God is not the problem. Many of us, at one time or another, have even found ourselves fighting against God. And all he wants to do is help us. You got to understand, and you know this, God is not a hard taskmaster. Neither does he force you. Neither does he manipulate you. That's all the enemy's attributes. Neither does God deceive you. Like, 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 like I said, my own life, I know me. My parents were Christians, you know. You know, I, I would consider them, you know, carnal Christians, you know. They didn't know much about the Lord as I know today about the Lord. But they did their best and they prayed. You know, and then, you know, some of my sisters, you know, when I was young, you know, some of my sisters got, got, got saved and was walking with the Lord. So I had family members that, that knew God. And looking back on my life, even though, even though I gave my life to the Lord, very young age, 11 years old. But because I didn't know his way. It was difficult for me to walk with God because I didn't know his ways. You know, you're going to do the examples that set before you. And so, you know, going on, you know, uh, going to church, doing the best that I could, you know, and, and, and looking back at my life, I, 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 I look back and I made decisions about my life. That I say today, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Now, they were good. But I said to myself, why did I do that? I'll give you an example. When I got out of high school, I was getting ready to go to college with my cousin. He, is, he was already did a year, you know, and then I was getting ready to go to college. And then, but he, he come out... <laughs> He come out, 
my friend, my neighbor down the road, he said, he said, come on, man, let's go in the military. I said, you out of your mind? I despise the military. Matter of fact, they were still drafting for numb. I said, no, man. But something on the inside of me. And, 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 and I didn't pray. I didn't ask God. And, and he convinced me to go in the military. And I despise the military. You know, I mean, I was I was an AB uh, 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 um, a school graduate. You know, things came easy for me. Didn't have to study hard. I'm the guy that went to the school with a pencil in his ear, and didn't have to study because I had an excellent memory. But here I am. I'm signing the dotted line to go into the military. And we go in the military on the buddy system. They call it the buddy system. In other words, you go through basic training and then you go to your first duty station together. He get his butt right there in the military and he gets set back. It's like God, he got me there. And then God said, whoop, okay, boom. <laughs> he split us up. He was done with him. But if that wasn't bad enough, I'm telling you, here's it. God didn't force me. The, these, I made these decisions and I look back and say, why did I do that? I look back now and I see God, the angel of the Lord was there. Do this. Do this. So here I am, you know, in the Air Force, you know, you make, if you make a certain score, you know, you can go into any of the classes, into any of the career fears, and I made a high enough score. He didn't. So he had to go, he, he was limited in what he go to. And here I'm going into electronics, you know, IT stuff. And him and his colonel talked me into going in what he was going into. Why would I do that? No sane person would have done that. But I did. And after he did all that, that's when he got set back. And so after we get close to, you know, graduating basic training, everybody's looking forward to going to tech school, you know, because you come out of boot training, then they send you to your, 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 your advanced school that you're going to go to and train you. And then the, the last week they come to me and say, you ain't going to tech school. I looked at them and said, what? I was like, you going DDA. What? What the heck is that? Direct duty assignment. Because, you know, what was in my background and whatnot. They said, you don't need tech school. You'll be able to do your job. <laughs> I wanted to quit right then and there, but I couldn't. What am I saying to you? God followed me. And set me up. He got me out of Memphis, Tennessee. Got me into Maryland. And that's why I met my ex-wife, walking across the street. Me and my buddy, we was in a, in, a, in, a, in a Corvette. She's walking across the street, and I tell him, stop the brakes, hit the brakes. And I jump out the car and run up to her and start running my rap. And the 70s rap was, hey, mama, do I know you? You know, you do that line on all of them, you know. Huh? And she aggro said no and kept walking. <laughs> what am I saying to you? It was all God. He got me there. And then here, here, here then here I am. I'm getting ready to, you know, uh getting close to, to getting out. And so they they come in and they offer me an assignment. They said, if you extend, we'll send you to, you to Chicksand, England. But God again, ever right around me, 
it's, they gave me choices. And Alaska was part of the choice. Who in their right mind would choose cold Alaska? Because if you ain't never been in, everybody just think about polar bears and Eskimos when you hear Alaska where I come from. Who in their right mind would choose Alaska over England? I did. Because God was in it. God wanted me here. I say, I, I'm using myself as an example. How God has a purpose. See, God just don't wing it. He has a purpose. He has a destiny. You might have a profession, but God still have a purpose and a destiny and a calling on you. And your profession is not necessarily your calling. Neither was mine. When I got here, did my thing, did my time, and got ready to get out. And I made the mistake. Now, by this time, I surrendered my life to the Lord. I'm coming back to the Lord. Now I'm hard after God. Because now I get turned on, you know, that word, that phrase I use, I get turned on to the word, and I find out that God actually communicates with you, that God actually wants to talk to you, that God will show you things to come. So I'm seeking God and I make the mistake of praying and asking him, what did he want me to do? Prior to that, he was just doing his thing. Now I'm coming into agreement with him. What do you want me to do? I wanted to leave Alaska. I did my time. I was tired of meeting Frosty the Snowman every morning. I was now ready to go. By that time, I had a Bible school in mind, and I was on my way. And the Lord started dealing with me about staying. See, now there's no manipulation. Now he's, 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 he's putting it inside of me now. Now I got to cooperate with him. Because I said I wanted to be in his will. I want his purpose for my life. Most of all, I wanted to be happy. And brother and sister, on that road, ever since then, every turn I made, every road I got on, God spoke to me and told me. Everything I've ever did, I never wanted to do. Everything. From preaching. I remember when the Lord called me to preach. I remember in 1980, I'm flying home. 19, July 1980, the 31st, I'm flying home to a funeral. And I'm sitting on the plane. I'm minding my own business. And then the plane disappears. The plane disappears. I'm sitting there. The people disappear. And I hear this noise, which I know now it was a frequency I was hearing. A high, it was a frequency of the Lord. And standing right in front of me was the Lord. And he introduces himself to me and said, I'm Christ, the I am. He called himself God. The I am is God. And he says to me, I've known you before the world ever existed. Because prior to that, I'm praying a prayer. Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm praying this prayer. And so I go on to Memphis. I shared it with my oldest sister. I said, does stuff like that happen? <laughs> so she showed me in the Bible where it happens all the time. That was the first of many times that it has happened to me. So I get back home, I get back home, and I'm laying on my bed, and, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm tossing and turning, can't, can't hardly get no sleep, and then he speaks to me in an audible voice. I hear him just as clear as you hear me now. And he says to me, preach my gospel, and I will be with you. See, now, I have, to, I have to hook up with this now. I have to agree with this. 
this is not in this is not distinctly with me someone says well you're a preacher so that no 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 before I was a preacher he was leading me and guiding me I just simply made a decision to do what he said when he showed me I made that decision And once he asked me to do that, I said, I can't preach. I can't preach. You know, because my definition of preaching, you know, right, we're coming, from, you know, coming from a black ethnicity, my je- definition of preaching, you know, like Shamba, you know, like Jimmy Swagger used to do, waving your hands like a windmill spitting cotton. You know, I mean, that was my definition. I couldn't see myself doing that. I remember sitting on a, sitting at my dining room table one night and struggling with this thing about preaching. And the Lord speaks into me and says, Son, the Bible says, the Lord has such sweet way of showing you things. He says, Son, the Bible says, I went into the temple and taught and I preached in their synagogue. Now, this is what the Lord said to me. You know how most, you know how most average black preachers preach, right? Do I have to demonstrate? Do I have to demonstrate? Some of y'all never been in a black church. Huh? Yeah, they grab me. <laughs> oh, that was that my microphone? Let me grab this. <laughs> hey, they grab the ear and go, ah, and Jesus. Ah, ah. That was my that was my idea of preaching. I couldn't see myself doing that. Now, isn't that amazing? I couldn't see myself doing that then, though that's what my dad used to do. And he was a preacher. I, I know the anointing. I know what it is and I know what it ain't. And he was anointed to preach. But I couldn't see myself doing that. And the Lord said to me, well, I preach in the temple. And he said to me, just like this, do you think that what the Bible said I preached I grabbed my ear and kicked the back of my robe out. That's what he said to me. And I laughed. I said, no, I don't think you did that, Lord. (laughs) But that so freed me. It took a shackle off of me. Just that simple truth. And I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. And ever since then, that's how he been leading me. Inside, something will rise up on the inside of me. A thought will rise up on his way. So I pull aside and, and seek his face and know for certain if that come from him. And then I'll do it. It's just that simple. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if you come after me, deny yourself and take up your cross. Many Christians live their whole life and never get in the will of God, ever. Ever. Well, if you never get in the will of God and purpose of God for your life, you're a Christian, but you're a baby, and you stay a baby. And when it comes to effectiveness in the kingdom, You never become effective. You never become a threat to the devil. And the devil will have you chasing your tail, your own Christian life, you know, bringing pressure, temptation, putting your weak pressure, using your weaknesses against you, and then forever have you chasing your tail. But you'll never know the freedom in Christ. You'll never know the authority in Christ. You'll never know the power that comes with walking with Christ. You'll never know it. Simply because you chose to choose your own, to live your own life. Brother, sister, I don't want that for you. Especially now. It doesn't matter how far behind you are. If you're alive and if you are breathing, you have time to redeem time. 
Amen. Simply saying yes to the Lord. Lord, why did you make me? What did you put inside of me that heaven needs? Because there's something inside of each one of us that heaven needs. He didn't have to place his dependency on you. He chose to. He chose to let you share in his inheritance. He chose to. But there is a price. There is a price. Your life. Your life. Just as he laid down his, you must lay down yours. And let me tell you something. You can't be afraid to surrender your life. Once you surrender your life to his will and purpose, listen to me. Take it from someone who knows. You start walking in true happiness, real joy. Because the you on the inside, the real you, has longed for that. It's embedded in the real you, your spirit. It's embedded there. He is, the, he is your manufacturer. He put his stamp and blueprint in your spirit. Amen. And Paul found that out in Romans chapter 7 and 8. When God got a hold of his life on the road of Damascus and God told can't think of his name right now. God, he sent him to, to pray for Paul that he might see. And God said, I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So was God just winging it? No. That was already written concerning Paul. Paul was already somewhat doing doing close to doing something that he thought was the will of God but he was on the wrong side he was being manipulated by the devil what God had put inside of him to use for him the enemy was now using and it's the same way with a lot of us but Paul said even concerning himself he said what I did I did ignorantly foolishly until the Lord got a hold of me and his eyes were open. Amen. Brother, sister, our eyes need to be open. And once our eyes is open to the reality of this king, we need to respond to him. And this is the problem with many Christians. Their eyes are open to him but they don't respond to him. They respond to him in the new birth, but then they stop. They stop. What if you give a birth to a child and then they they forever stay a baby? They stop growing. Well, that's what Christians do. They stop. Why do they stop? Growing. Why do they stop being effective? Because they don't continually give themselves to him. Because he is your food. He is the bread that came from heaven. He is your food. If you're to continue to grow, to, to be nourished, amen, and to become productive in his kingdom, you must eat of him. And in eating of him, you come to your purpose, why you were created. Amen. That's what I found. And I surrendered. And I was glad I did. You cannot pay me 
a million times a million dollars to turn back. Why? Because I found true joy and happiness. Amen. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? You will never know real happiness and joy until you surrender to him. Huh? We go and join, we, we've relegated to all types of foolish things. We go to a church and we shake a preacher's hand. Come on, you want to join this church? And then they think, you know, they've arrived. God ain't interested in your hand. He wants your heart. And then he wants to shape it. After his will and purpose. Amen. So now, when the Lord leads me to do something, you know what he said to me? <laughs> he said, I want you to do this. Well, I don't really want to do that. You know what he said to me? You can do what you want to. But if you want to be in my will, you do what I tell you. <laughs> now, he didn't talk to me when I was a baby like that. <laughs> but now he does. Why? Because I know better. And so, when he asked me, I have no problem doing what he asked me, even though I don't want to. Why? Because I love it. The more I obey him, the more, it's a trap, y'all. You hear me? I'm going to tell you right now, it's a trap. <laughs> the more I obey him, the more my love grows for him the more I can't say no when he asks me something. <laughs> That's how your love grows. Amen. That's how your love grows in the natural. Huh? You don't do something for your spouse just to shut them up. I just did to shut them up. I tired of them nagging me. <laughs> that ain't love. First you do things because you love. And then you really do things when you know that that's what they like. Right? Love motivates you. And then the more you do, the more you fall in love. Huh? Right? Now listen to me. Saying I love you is not enough. Though you should. But love, saying I love you without action is dead. Just like faith without works is dead. It's no different with the Lord. He's the one said, not me, John 14. If you love me, do what I say. Right? Didn't he say that? But don't sit there and say you love the Lord and don't do what he said. First of all, written and then spoken. If you don't do the written, you will never hear the spoken. Because you learn his voice by doing the written. Right? By doing the written. And when that same truth speaks in your heart, there is no doubt. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to wonder if it was him. Because they both sound the same. Matter of fact, it's not a voice anyway. 
is thought impressed upon your mind. Thoughts. In the spirit realm, words are not exchanged. Thoughts are. They communicate with thoughts. Thoughts travel faster than the speed of light. And so it is, it, it, it is no different. Even if you see the Lord, you say, well, I, I want to see the Lord. So, so, so I want to hear what he said. I want, I want to hear him say to me. When he, you see him, he won't move his mouth. He can. But 90%, 99% of the time, he won't even move his lips. His thoughts will be transferred to you. Well, that's no different now. It's no different now. Every time you bow your knees, every time you stop and close your eyes, every time you speak to Jesus and say, Jesus, he appears right beside you. Whether you see him or not, he does. He doesn't send an angel. He comes for your words because you're his child. When your baby cries and needs your help, did you sit there and just let him cry? As a good parent, no. You respond to them. He's no different. And when he appears and you talk to him and communicate to him and then you wait and listen to him, his thoughts will be transferred into your thoughts. And just like anything else in life, you become good at it by what? Practicing. So I wrap it up with this. This is very important, especially now. We're moving into a time that you need to hear the Lord and know it's Him. Know it's Him without a shadow of a doubt. Because the spirit of deception is arising in our nation like never before. Amen. Amen. And Jesus tests for 40 days. The enemy appeared to him and spoke to him face to face. Why was it a test to the Lord? Why was it a test? It was a test to the Lord because he offered them something that the Lord was after. The kingdoms of this world. Amen. But then he tried to deceive the Lord. I don't know why he thought he would deceive him. But what did the Lord use against the enemy? The word. Jesus quoted the Old Testament scriptures to him. The Psalms to him. And so what did the devil do? Okay. I'm good at that game. So the devil started quoting scriptures to him. And what did Jesus do? He quoted scriptures back to him. It was a war of words. Right? Y'all know the story? If you be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus said, Man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Everything the devil says to you, there is a godly response from truth or from the Lord who is on the inside of you. Truth got truth through the test, and truth will only get you through every test. Not how you feel. What you know. What's in you. What has become a part of you. You become the weapon. You become truth. That is the only way that we're going to win. In this hour now. The only way. And if you're not on the path that you're supposed to be on, I admonish you, 
find it quickly. Because your safety, he is the rock. He is the tower. Your safety, it's only in him. Only in him. Because the day is coming for all of those who are outside of him, they will not make it. I'm telling you, whether they're born again or not, they will not make it. He said, come unto me. Psalm says, hide under the shadow of his wing. Oh, there will be legitimate baby Christians out there that God would have the adult Christians taken care of. But if you're not a legitimate baby Christian and you're supposed to be growing, you're in trouble. I'm telling you, you're in trouble. The enemy will be able to do things in our day that he have never been able to do on this planet. How? Why? Because we're at, we're at the time of the end. This is the fullness of time. The enemy has come down because he knows what? He has but a short time. There is a certain thing, there is a certain time that the enemy is looking to happen in Scripture and it will start the clock for him and he knows exactly when that is. And he will know exactly how much time he has to do damage. And you and I must be prepared. Huh? You must become an overcomer. Whatever the enemy throws at you, you must overcome. You must overcome. Come on, stand. Hallelujah. Come on, just bow your heads for a moment. Father, we just thank you. We thank you tonight. You led us down this road of words. We followed you as best as we could. You've spoken to their heart tonight. Whatever pricked their heart, Holy Spirit, magnified a thousandfold now. Let it resonate within their heart. Let it reverberate within their soul. Cause it to pass through their mind again and again and again. Before the enemy steals it. He always comes for the truth, for the word, to steal it. We just cover that word now, supernaturally. Let them continue to feed upon it, Lord. As you speak to them, let light come to their understanding. Show yourself within the word. You are a good God. You want the best for everyone. But we must be willing. You don't force yourself on anyone. Let them know tonight, Lord, there is a higher way. There is a better way. There is a richer way. The 
way that you have chosen for them. They will not go unrewarded if, you, if they choose your way. The greatest reward is you. Forever being with you. But there are other rewards you give. Working in the kingdom for you. Reveal this truth, Lord. Show them their portion, their part. Pour within them your great need for them. Holy Spirit, let them hear the call of heaven to come up. To come up to the throne of God. the highway. Thank you, Father. Come on, just lift up both hands. Thank God for his word. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you tonight for your faithfulness to us. You ever live it to make intercessions for us. Thank you for praying for us. Oh, great high priest, we know you will continue to pray for them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, God is good, amen? Praise God. Well, turn around and greet someone before you go.